Our current topic is design properties of materials. There are several different properties we'll look at, but one of the most important we'll begin with is tensile strength. It's determined experimentally. You have to measure it. It's not something you can calculate based on a particular alloy or anything because the strength depends on more than just what particular atoms make up the metal or whatever it be. It can be uh, plastic. It can be all sorts of things. There can still be tensile strength. Now, what happens is we apply a load to, the, to a sample and measure the strain or the, the deformation. And then once we take that, that curve, that stress versus strain diagram, we can see behavior of the material. Now, this is, this is a general approach to apply a load to a material and see how much it deflects or see how much it strains. And so whether we're applying load to a material linearly and stretching it or we're taking a rod and twisting it, whatever we're doing, we're looking at load versus or stress versus deflection or strain. And this is not unlike anything you would have seen before. You've considered springs, linear springs for example, and if you've thought of a uh, linear spring and seen the equation for it, you know it's F equals KX. So it's a linear spring where the deflection is simply proportional, that's what the K is for, it's a spring constant, proportional to the force. So here's a typical stress strain diagram for steel. There are several points of interest along the way. You'll notice that strain is on the x-axis. It's dimensionless. So it could be either inch per inch, meter per meter, whichever you like. And then the y-axis is the stress applied to the material. So what you notice is that the stress and strain are in fact linear related for a relatively small section of this or the beginning section of this curve. Because we're going to go from 0, 0, right? Because at 0, 0 there's, there's no stretching because there's no load. So that's our initial point. And as you apply more and more load, the stretching increases proportionally. So this is so far just like a linear spring. As a matter of fact, point A is the first point where the uh, stress first deviates, uh, where the stress curve first deviates from a straight line. And this point A has a name. It's called the proportional limit. And that makes sense, right? Because the stress is just proportional to the strain. So point A is the first point where we're going to deviate from proportionality, right, where they, the stress and strain will no longer just be uh, one multiplied by a constant and you get the other out of it. Now continuing along the curve we end up at point B which is clo relatively close to point A for many steels and this is where the material will no longer return to its ori original size and shape. So this point is a an elastic limit. Now a lot of times people think of the elastic limit and the proportional limit being very close or the same thing and that's not necessarily the case but anyway the elastic limit is defined as the point where the material no longer regains its shape. Now understand it's not necessary that getting to this region be linear the whole way, right? I mean, we could have nonlinear deformation of the material where the stress and strain are not proportional. As long as the material returns back to its original shape once the load is released, then you know we haven't reached the ela uh, elastic limit. Point C is called the yield point, and this is essentially the point where there's no a uh, significant increase in stress for an increase in strain. So that it stretches and stretches at constant force essentially. That's known as the yield point. And then finally another point of interest on our curve is the maximum strength of the material, the ultimate strength, okay, the, the highest stress before the material finally fractures and fails. Now as we move past this point, the actual stress increases although the load decreases and so what's happening here is the material is it's pulling apart. But at the ultimate strength, that was the, uh, the ultimate strength on a uh, per original cross section basis. Okay, so some curves look like what we just saw. Some high strength uh, steels and aluminum and titanium have a different nature to their curve. They look different. There's no real clearly defined yield point and so we define a value of yield stress that is on the curve. It's called the 0.2 percent offset. So it's uh, where we, we draw a line parallel to the linear portion that is offset by a strain of 0.002 
and uh, that line where it intersects the stress strain curve, we call that the yield strength. Now if you continue stretching this material and stressing it, applying load and it continues to stretch and strain, then eventually you'll again reach an ultimate strength where the material finally fails. Now I didn't show you a brittle chart, but brittle charts typically just have a straight section, just a linear elastic region, and then failure occurs at the very end. And there's other things to look at. The area under the curve, for example, is interesting, but I won't go into that here. Uh, we're not going to use it very much in this class, so in fact we won't use it at all. It is an important property. In fact, there are a ton of material properties that are useful. I'm just pulling out the ones that are most important. But materials is a huge area to study. You should realize that because you've had at least two, if not three, classes with us already in materials. And you're likely to have more. If you've only had two, I think we've got three in our curriculum at this point. So materials are very important. A lot of times materials give rise to new opportunities, you know, uh, new combinations of strength or stiffness to, to density uh, or cost make a big difference in the things that we can achieve in design as engineers. So Hooke's law is something that applies as long as we're below the proportional limit. So this is kind of like treating the component as if it was just a linear spring, right? You've got, uh, in a linear spring, you've got F equals KX. Here the analogous equation is stress, normal stress, equals the elastic modulus times the strain. So our stress sigma on the left-hand side of the equation is a lot like F in a linear spring. Our E on the right-hand side of the equation is a lot like K in a linear spring. And then... Uh, epsilon is the strain, of course, which is a lot like deflection of a spring. So as long as we're below that, that proportional limit, the material behaves linearly as we would, would like it to so that we can predict its behavior uh, quite easily. Now there are many times that students are confused and think that this applies all the way up to the, um, uh, the ultimate strength, but that's not the case at all. Notice the curves even the material that was very strong, the curve deviated from a straight line uh, significantly after the yield point or the proportional limit. So um, just be careful, this equation only applies for a section of material. It doesn't apply for all stresses and strains. Now ductility is another particular uh, number that we're interested in. It's really just how much a material, how much abuse it can take before it fra fails and fractures. Uh, so it's how much it can stretch and yield uh, before it can uh, fracture. Now brittle materials are not ductile. They suddenly just fracture. They stretch and stretch elastically and then all of a sudden they, um, they fail. Uh, on the other hand, ductile materials can stretch and they can be permanently elongated um, and yet not fail until much later. Think, think of the difference between a rubber band and a piece of granite, okay? If you have a, a piece of granite and you apply enough load to it, you can make it fracture. That's a brittle material. It will stretch before fracture, but it won't, fra it won't stretch a lot, right? You imagine taking a rubber band and stretching it, you could obviously stretch it quite a lot before it pulls apart and fails. And so metals that are ductile are that way, and the amount of ductility is something that is worth knowing so that we can know how much a material will essentially stretch before it, it gives up. A brittle failure and a ductile failure look very different. Here we have two separate samples. The one on the left is ductile, the one on the right is brittle. And you can see how there is permanent deformation on the left component. Now these were two halves of a sample that were pulled apart and then they were just, instead of being end to end, they're placed uh, with you know the fracture up so you can see both sides of the fracture. But both of these began as uh, just simply columns with a constant cross-section. But you see that the cup and cone fracture uh, uh, sample has necked down quite a lot, right? It has permanent deformation. It was able to absorb energy essentially in its, its springiness and uh, not just fracture. Uh, it was able to deform even permanently. Uh, and not fracture. You've probably done this with a spring. If you ever had a, a spring out of a pen and you took it and you just pulled both ends, you notice that it deforms and it, it stays elongated. So it's a ductile type of material. Brittle materials, on the other hand, usually break in a very different fashion. So notice that with the cup and cone fracture, there's an angle to the break. There's a reason for that. It has to do with the fact that ductile materials break due to shear stresses, but brittle, ma brittle materials fail tried to say brittle and fail at the same time, didn't work. Brittle materials fail uh, 
due to normal stresses. So we'll see why that is a little bit later with more circle, but for now, just uh, take my word for it if you would. Um, but there's a very different nature in the failure of a brittle versus a ductile material. So we need some way to define uh, ductility. What is it really? Well, we will use percent elongation to measure ductility. So percent elongation is a pretty simple way to do it. It's just the final length of the piece minus the initial length over the initial length essentially. Also called the gauge length. And, and the reason we use gauge length is because when you have a sample and you're stretching it, uh, usually what you'll do is you'll have a gauge on a certain portion of the, the sample, the linear sample, and so you measure the initial gauge length and you measure the final length but not the overall length. The, the, the length between those two points on the gauge also once it's um, uh, elongated all the way to failure. And then multiplied by 100% is percent elongation. So um, if the percent elongation is greater than 5%, we call it a ductile material. If it's less, we call it a brittle material. It's somewhat of an arbitrary cutoff, but uh, that's, that's what we use. And these material properties are listed in the back of your book. As a matter of fact, at this point, you should pause the video and go to the appendices. I don't remember which one it is. There, there's a couple of appendices that give you properties for steel and for aluminum. And if you don't go and mark them now, it's not the end of the world, but you should become familiar with the appendix. As we go through example problems, I'll certainly point out particular pages, and you'll see us reference them over and over, so it's wise to uh, put a tab on those pages. Uh, steel is one of the most commonly used metals, and I will tell you that as we get into this portion of the talk, this is my weakest area. Uh, my strength is in many other areas, but this is my weakest area. It's why I don't teach some of the material courses we have. You'd think with my first degree being chemical engineering, this would be one of my strengths, but it isn't. <laughs> Probably explains a little bit about why I got out. Chemical engineering was fun and it was interesting and I learned a lot and made good grades, but uh, it just wasn't what I was uh, cut out for, I think. I was just very different, more, much more interested in mechanical areas. I'm glad I went through it. I learned a lot. But chemistry is not one of the things I really uh, learned well. I understand it to some extent and understand some things about it, particularly organic chemistry, I think, is, is interesting. There's some very basic, interesting things about fuels uh, that you can learn from organic chemistry. A anyway, so steels are just alloys of iron and other elements. Now, iron is the primary ingredient, but carbon is a common ingredient. And there can be many other elements in order to... Uh, tailor the properties of the steel. And there's four primary classifications. You've got carbon, alloy, stainless, and structural steels, at least for the purpose of, of our class. So here's some common alloy steels uh, and what they're typically used for. They're from your book. It's table 2-7. It's on page 72. But there's also another table that I find interesting. I guess it's the chemistry background uh, coming out in me. But they're the each one of these, the first two numbers, designate the type of alloying element. And so if you look in table 2-6, it'll tell you sort of a cross-reference. The one they don't have is 8760. Of course, the 87 would be the part we're interested in. Um, and so I'm not sure what the 87 uh, refers to. It didn't seem to me when I looked, like, looked at it like they were using the first couple of numbers to reference a particular uh, element number in the periodic table or anything like that. So um, maybe I missed it, but I didn't, didn't notice that trend. Um, but there is a nice little cross-reference there to show you what they are uh, doing, what the, the element is from the first two um, numbers. I think probably more interesting is this table because it tells you, you know, given a, a particular AISI steel number, what is its, its typical use? What, what is it used for? Um, now, you'll notice that 4140, 4150 says same as 4130, so it uses, it's used for the same purposes as 4130. But other than that, at least this would be a guide for what you would use these various uh, metals for. And it's important to notice that there's a wide variety of metals, and not just due to the alloying element, right? The, the atom or the, the atomic makeup of the steel is not by any means what completely controls the properties of the steel. There are many other things. Uh, in our lab, we have an x-ray gun, and the x-ray gun's purpose is to measure what particular 
elements you have in a sample of metal. Now, please don't use it without being trained or being taught because it does produce x-rays. And of course, x-rays are something you want to be very careful with. But either get me or get uh, our lab technician. We can show you how to use the thing. In the labs that we have in the class, you'll have to use that at least to get an idea of what material you're dealing with. Often you'll make a sample or get a sample of some unknown steel. And you'd really like to know what it is, how strong it is, what what uh, what is its alloy. But also, you really need to know what its heat treatment is, because heat treatment is another very important part of the way that materials behave. So, um, heat treatment is treatment with with high temperatures that allows us to control the microstructure. And again, I'm out of my depth here, really talking about this. I find it a fascinating topic, but. The difficulty for me is there's so much memorization. I'm just not good at that. I'm good at figuring things out and understanding how they work. But um, I find this fascinating. I find it amazing that someone even figured this out. You know, um, I do understand the resulting parameters and how the steels may vary in terms of their strength or their, um, you know, their ductility. Any of those things. Uh, one interesting thing is that steel's elastic modulus doesn't really vary regardless of the alloy, and that's that's kind of interesting. Uh, essentially, steel will have roughly 30 times 10 to the 6 elastic modulus in, in PSI, or 207 gigapascals, I think it is. It's either 209 or 207, I always forget. But the uh, essentially, the inherent material elasticity does not change by the... Um, the heat treat or the alloy or any of those things. It does change a little bit and we take that into account when we work with springs and machine elements but uh, it's just interesting that doesn't change but the strength properties do. So quenching is something where you, you take a hot you know piece of, of material steel and you dip it into something whether it's air you can air quench things but it's not a very quick cool down uh, you can quench things in oil, in water, and basically what happens is heat is transferred rapidly from the steel and whatever microstructure the steel had in its high temperature um, uh, you know, state is essentially preserved. Now, interestingly, the, the material properties can actually vary throughout the cross-section. If you think of just a round ball that you try to quench, the center is going to stay hot a lot longer than the outside surface when you say drop it in a vat of water. And so there's more time for s relatively slow cooling of the center and therefore different material properties throughout the object. So something to be aware of when you try to specify you know, that a part needs to be quenched in order to have a, a particular strength. Now quenching very quickly typically leads to high strength but uh, uh, very brittle. So high strength, high hardness but a very brittle component. Tempering is something that can improve ductility, so it's basically reheating and holding at a temperature for a certain amount of time in order to uh, often sacrifice a little bit of the strength, but greatly improve the ductility. Uh, normalizing is something that gives you nice uniform grain structure. It gives you really good ductility and good machinability, but at the cost of strength. Usually this is a, a trade-off between the ultimate strength and the ductility of, of the steel. Full annealing is where you've taken the component and you've just made it as soft as possible so that it's easy to form and machine. And this is, uh, this is something I think that people, at least at beginning engineers, don't take advantage of as much as they possibly could. If you buy a steel and you use it in its soft form, you can reduce tool wear, you can you know, do all kinds of, of, of good things in your process in terms of speed and production and the cost to produce parts. And then if you harden after forming, essentially after machining, uh, then you can really produce a part that is very strong. Um, obviously, if you don't have the option to heat treat things, or if you have very small runs, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But, you know, if you have a steel that's already hardened, it's very difficult to machine and work with it uh, without damaging tools and, you know, failing in trying to make the uh, metal uh, what shape you, you want. As a matter of fact, it's pretty common in uh, everyday life and family members I've seen that they'll get some piece of metal and they don't realize that there's so much difference and so much variety in steels. And they'll say, well, I want to put a hole in it. So they'll grab a drill bit and start trying to drill. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And they get all frustrated because they don't understand that, you know, sometimes when you grab a piece of steel and you try to drill on it, it may be hardened and <laughs> it may be harder than the drill bit and nothing's going to happen. 
Now, obviously, there are better and better tools, you know, harder tools for drilling into harder material, and sometimes it's not practical to uh, anneal something just so that you can machine it. And, of course, there's a problem that when you uh, uh, reheat it and uh, then quench it and then, you know, continue to process it with tempering, etc., it, its shape could change enough that it's no longer any good. So that's the downside of heat treatment after the geo the geo uh, geometric shape you want has been achieved. Um, there's also stress relief annealing where you're trying to remove all residual stresses in order to prevent distortion. So if you uh, have a piece that needs to uh, be machined, um, if you don't anneal it before machining, it can it can bow a lot. It's kind of like lumber. I don't know if you've ever taken a two by four and sawn it down the middle. But when you do, you typically, even if you started with a nice straight board, you typically end up with some pretty warped wood. Uh, steel can, uh, can act the same way. So can aluminum, actually. Many metals can. Now, stainless steel is a variation. It's still primarily iron. There's a lot of people think that uh, stainless steel is, and I'm referencing family members, I won't mention who, they think stainless steel is uh, corrosion resistant because it doesn't have any iron in it. Well, actually, it's primarily iron. The corrosion resistance is primarily from the alloying element, chromium. And, you know, an average amount, there, there's multiple types of stainless steels. I've even included a video I want you to see just to kind of get a map of the stainless steels and the various alloying and treatments that are used to give various properties to stainless steel. But the main alloying element is chromium, and average is about 17%, anywhere from 10 on the low end to about 27% on the high end is the range of reasonable chromium to add to iron in order to make it stainless. And there's many other alloying elements that are added for different purposes as well. Uh, the 300 series is fairly common. It gives you relatively high strength and ductility, uh, but it's, it's non-magnetic. Now, people also seem to think that all stainless steel is non-magnetic, and that's not the case. There are stainless steels that are magnetic. So you, you can't just use a magnet to determine what is stainless and what is not, although many stain, uh, stainless steels are not magnetic. Um, one thing about stainless, although it has good corrosion resistance, often it's weaker than just a, a common steel. So um, sometimes it's high strength, sometimes it's low strength. It just depends on the alloy. There are some steels that are stronger than some stainlesses and vice versa. So. Uh, just be aware of that when you, you go to uh, uh, design. I know I bought some stainless steel screws at one point, and I'll show you those. I'll actually show you a picture of it when I uh, go through the torsion information in the class, because I, I don't remember what I did with this screw. I drove it into something or backed it out or something, and you can literally see around the outside edge of the body of the screw how twisted it is, where the, the entire shaft length the, the end wasn't turning and the, um, the the head made multiple probably oh I don't know I'm guessing 10 at least revolutions while the threads were just sitting still it was really amazing to me that the thing didn't snap before it actually did I've got the two pieces I ended up I think I ended up having to dig the threads out with something else I sacrificed the piece of wood just because it was such an interesting break but I'll show you pictures of that later anyway it was a stainless steel screw and it wasn't particularly hard it wasn't particularly, I mean, it had a lot of ductility, all, obviously, but not very much strength. Now, structural steel comes in a couple of different varieties, well, more than a couple, but the two primary classifications are either hot rolled or cold rolled, or also cold drawn. And hot rolled really has relatively low strength, has high ductility, it's easy to work with, but it's relatively soft and relatively low strength. Cold rolled on, rolled, on the other hand, is hot rolled that's then further processed. So hot rolled just means that the shape is attained while the uh, metal, the steel, is hot. But cold rolled and cold drawn, they are two different things. I'll explain that in a second. But cold rolled, the material is allowed to cool, and then it's, it's rolled through very high force rollers that induce stresses, residual stresses in the surface of the material, but change its, its shape significantly. So it ends up uh, imparting a lot of strength to the component, but uh, reduces the ductility. Now cold drawn is where material is, is drawn or pulled essentially through a die. And it typically has the highest strength, but also less ductility. Now structural steel uh, is classified by ASTM. A36 is really a, a common carbon steel. 
and you'll see that later on in the text. In the book, there's a ton of information about materials in this chapter, which is chapter two. I'm not going to ask you to read all of it. I have included a whole lot of videos for you to watch to get kind of an overview of things. Um, if nothing else, I would keep this book for the sake of the material information in it because it has a, one of the best, I think, material collection information that I've seen. Uh, I haven't seen a lot, but this one's pretty impressive to me, unless your materials book is better. Um, but this is a, a really good, I guess, summary uh, of all the materials that are available for designing. And, and an interesting thing about materials is that it's an ongoing development area. So I think it was about maybe five or ten years ago I heard about a new steel that automotive manufacturers were using that had uh, less weight and about 20% more strength. Now 20% more strength doesn't sound like a lot, but that's one-fifth more strength. That's, that's it enough to reduce the size of components and yet the vehicle still be safe. And that can lead to reduced weight, which then can lead to higher fuel economy and, and all kinds of, of benefits. So materials aren't a static area that, you know, all the development's been done 100 years ago and there's nothing else to discover. No, it is an ongoing area. Plastics and composites became popular, um, you know, within uh, probably a little bit before my lifetime, you know, 50s, 60s in that area is where they really started to to take off and be ubiquitous and everything. Uh, I worked for a company out of uh, college, actually it was um, an internship. Uh, it was a company called Banjo Corporation. They make a lot of valves and pumps and things like that, primarily for the agricultural industry. So if you've ever done any farming, you may have used some of their, their valves and components. It's named Banjo Corporation just because the owner that started the company liked banjo. So he decided that on the, the valves, the handles, the manual valves, that the handles should have a banjo on them, and they do, and that's what it's called. It's just a small company in Crawfordsville, Indiana, but they make um, some really good uh, components. And in fact, I guess, you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery, and so there are a ton of Taiwanese and Chinese valves that are made copying every detail of banjo's design. And I got to see some of those while I was there because the, the lead engineer took me back into the coordinate measuring machine room. We took apart some valves and put the components from the competitors on this coordinate measuring machine and touched off points to measure different features and tolerances and so forth. And what we found is that Banjo Corporation's valves had much tighter tolerances, uh, much better geometric control. So some of the, you know, with a coordinate measuring machine, you can get a pretty accurate measure of how far out of round a hole is, for example. You know, and, and, and that's really important. If you're thinking of a ball valve, the ball valve needs to interface with round features very well. And if the round feature is out of round, well, you're going to end up with leaks or damaged seals or whatever. Well, one really interesting thing is that none of the manufacturer's valves we looked at used the particular material that Banjo used. Banjo used a glass-filled plastic, and what that means is it wasn't just plastic they were injecting into their molds. It was plastic with glass fibers, just like you'd have if you install fiberglass insulation in your home, but not in a, a bat form. It was just little pieces that were all chopped up and finely distributed throughout the plastic. Well, one of the things about that type of material is it's fairly hard on plastic molds. It'll wear the molds relatively quickly. So Banjo had to put more money into making new molds once their molds started to deteriorate, their, their metal molds. And I guess the, the knockoffs didn't want to go to that effort. So they just made it out of plain plastic. Well, plain plastic doesn't have the rigidity and the, you know, it comes out of the, the machine hot. And so it can deform quite a bit. And so that's how they really was the material that gave Banjo the edge, which I, th I found interesting. And they were, you know, of course, using a composite, a plastic composite. And so it was, uh, it had a lot of really good properties besides the, me the higher mechanical strength, the better dimensional stability, and the, uh, it actually had more resistance to uh, thermal effects and being outside. So for a product that's going to be out in the, the field plowing and getting dirty all day and with the sun beating down on it, that's a pretty good uh, improvement, not only in strength, but in uh, thermal resistance. All right, but anyway, on to aluminum. Um, there's many different um, alloying elements for aluminum as well. Uh, the 1000 series is a very soft, very easy to bend uh, aluminum that's nearly pure. There's very little uh, alloy. 6000 series, 6061 is ubiquitous. You'll hear that everywhere. It's very common. Uh, 
but it's a particular alloy that has primarily silicon and, and magnesium in it. And there are many other alloys as well. I would refer you to the book here because this is really, again, not my strength. And honestly, most of you in the class probably know more about materials at this point than I do because you have had more materials classes than I've had. And so I'll refer you to the book, really page 71 on to the end of the chapter is some very good information about steel, aluminum, you know, uh, concrete is in there, I noticed. There's uh, composites of many different kinds and you know, th there's enough variation within the alloys that go into steel to easily span multiple volumes of, of books. And so trying to cover all of this in, in our class, in the first place, is not really our focus. But also, it, I would be at a loss, not only because of my lack of knowledge in the field of materials, but also because it's just so broad. I mean, you can spend your life in steel. And, and composites, by the way, are even more varied than steel. There's more possibilities in composites even, because there's just so many more combinations. So... Um, Really, the thing to do is to stay aware of what developments are occurring in the field of materials and try to keep up with things. But most of the time, in smaller companies especially, you'll find that common materials are just reused over and over because they, they work. They have adequate strength, adequate toughness, whatever is needed for the application, so they're used. And if you run into trouble where, oh, well, I need, you know, every time I make this part, I can't really change the design, and they keep breaking, well, just call your material supplier and see if they have an option. Again, one of the things that I, I hope you get out of um, this course and other courses is the importance of communication with other people in the field that know more than you do about their particular area. This is what sales engineers are all about. This is what applications engineers are all about. And some of you may become those things. And you'll learn more than I'll ever know about you know, your particular field. And that's just the nature of the, 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 the discipline. It's such a broad discipline. There's so much to know. I honestly don't feel bad not knowing these things because I know if I needed a different material, I would call up a, a material supplier and say, hey, here's my problem. I tried this particular material. It didn't work. And I know enough about materials to know what I can do to improve things and probably succeed. For example, I've got a small staple gun. And maybe I'll show you the part at some point through the course. But it's a small staple gun I bought at Harbor Freight. I love the thing mainly because there's no safety on the trigger. Okay, I know that sounds bad. But so much of the time, safeties, yeah, okay, I admit, I've almost drove, driven a nail through my thumb, and I'm really glad the safety was there. But this is just a little bitty staple. It could be dangerous, but I wear safety glasses and gloves and so forth. And it's just handy to be able to you know, drive a bunch of staples. And it's, it's really nice because it uses the same staples. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the, the old arrow staplers that are hand staples. You have to push really down on the, the handle, push on it hard. It's a lot of work. It's very difficult to get the staple to come out. Nine times out of ten, it seems like it won't penetrate hardly anything. Well, this is a pneumatic stapler that actually turns out uses the exact same size staples. And this thing drives staples like a dream. It is so nice. Now, it being a relatively cheap uh, tool, it broke, of course. So I went to Harbor Freight to buy another one because they're cheap enough. Well, they've changed the design and they don't shoot those staples anymore, which I really prefer. So I decided to repair it. It turns out there's a little plate that's driven by a piston, and that plate is just a simple rectangular piece, and all it does is hit the, the top, the head of the staple, and just drive it in. But there's actually a hole in the top of the, the rectangular plate, just cross-drilled, uh, so that you can put a pin in it, and basically as the piston retracts, it can pull this plate back up to prepare to hit the next staple. Well, of course, what should fail but the area of that hole? And there's a reason. It's because of stress concentration. So I said, well, no problem. Obviously, I can't fix this one. I'll just make another one. So I grabbed a piece of steel. I uh, tried to figure out what the alloy was with our um, uh, x-ray gun. Got something that I thought was close. And cross-drilled a hole. Got the size about right. And it worked. It was beautiful. I drove a bunch of staples. Seemed like it was brand new. Well, it stopped working. And I was trying to figure out why. And I looked in it, of course, with the air disconnected. And the, this plate that's supposed to be driven by the piston and drive the staples in there for, um, this plate where I had drilled a hole had deformed so much that the hole had elongated by a good, you know, it was at least two or three times the original diameter of the hole, and yet it had not fractured like the original part did. So what I realized 
just understanding the principles of materials properties is that the original part was probably a little bit too brittle. It fractured and failed. My part was too ductile. I needed to heat treat it and make it a little, you know, give it a little bit more strength and take the yield point up farther so it wouldn't yield so badly. So just understanding that was enough for you know, what I needed to do. If I needed something beyond that, I would go to a material supplier if it was a professional problem, you know, and uh, find out if there's some other material or some other way I can treat the material in order to improve the performance and make it last longer in the tool. Now, aluminum and steel both depend heavily, their properties depend heavily on the way that they are, are tempered or the way they're heat treated. Uh, and also cold working it makes an even bigger difference in aluminum than it does in steels. If you've ever tried to fatigue a, a steel piece of wire, you know it's fairly difficult. You can take a metal coat hanger and bend it quite a long time before it breaks. But if you've ever installed some chain link fencing, you know that it comes with, or you can buy aluminum wire to tie it. Well, if you twist that wire and then untwist it, it usually breaks during untwisting. Uh, and the reason is because it's so sensitive to cold working. And basically when you bend something, you're, you're cold working it. Um, there are many different tempers that are used. Uh, if, uh, uh, you know, it, well, I'll, I'll back up. So there's the fully annealed temper, and that's a, an O indication. There's H temper, which is a strain hardened, and then T for uh, heat treated. Now the, the H is, you see some alloys of aluminum can't be um, uh, strain hardened and some can, okay? Or some can't be heat, I said that backwards, I'm sorry. Some alloys of aluminum cannot be heat treated and some can. So those that cannot be heat treated, you typically, def you bend them, you, you deform them, you do something, you cold work them in order to develop the strength. Whereas if it's something where you can just heat them and quench or whatever you need to do, uh, then they're heat treated and so the the designation at the end tells how the material was treated in order to reach whatever the specified strength and properties are. Now there are a couple of diagrams at the end of the chapter that I really like. I couldn't, there's so much in the chapter I really don't have time to go through it all. Already I've been longer winded than I wanted to be and I'm still not even scratching the surface and not even telling you everything I know and yet I don't know everything to tell you. Uh, so I feel at a loss. Really, this topic of materials, obviously it's a, a topic that you've had multiple courses in. It's a topic that many different texts, uh, textbooks uh, revolve around. This is just one. Uh, this is Professor Michael F. Ashby. As, the, as of recording this video, I believe he's still alive. He's, in, uh, uh, he's part of the University of Cambridge. And... Um, it's a really good book. It's where I got these diagrams from. The diagrams in your book look exactly like this, but there's some things missing. I think that something happened in publishing where uh, some of the important information was not transferred over. And these are useful enough charts that I wanted to give you just the knowledge that they exist. The knowledge of how to use them is a little more complicated. I just wanted you to know they exist. And this is the text that I, I uh, pulled them from. So he, this is a, a well-known uh, professor and uh, expert in the field of materials. Multiple, you know, uh, positions, um, uh, textbooks written, very well respected. And I couldn't, uh, you know, obviously didn't want to use this without giving credit. But um, one of the things that is confusing about this, this, this is kind of a selection chart. And let, let's start there. The strength of the material is on the y-axis, the density is on the x-axis. A lot of times when you're designing something, you try to minimize weight, okay? So you want, if you want the airplane to fly, right, that's the classic example, you can't have too much weight. So how do you minimize the weight and yet accomplish the strength? Well, part of that is from material selection. Um, and it's kind of nice to see that there's this correlation between strength and density. That, that makes some sense, right? You've got your, your metals in the upper area in that sort of uh, pinkish area and foams and, you know, rubbers and things more down in the, the lower light green area. So that makes some sense. But it turns out that there's actually some selection lines for minimizing the mass of the design. And this is something that your author didn't really discuss, so I thought I would just point it out. For details of how all of this works, I highly recommend uh, Professor Ashby's book or any of the materials books out there that include these because I'm going to show you two of the charts, but there's a ton of other charts where the x-axis, for example, is cost or maybe it's strength versus elastic modulus. 
And so all of these things really are trade-offs between two, two variables. And since you might need multiple variables to be optimized, there are also computer programs to help in material selection. But let's just start with this to kind of understand it. You'll notice three curves down at the bottom. Those curves are not they're not meant to be at that particular location necessarily. They're supposed to give you an angle. That's really what they're there for. And so you have to decide what's the minimum strength and you can figure out density based on other properties. Again, I'll refer you to the, the textbook I mentioned and showed you. But you can essentially determine, okay, I can use a material in this region of the chart. Okay, and then what you do is depending on the geometry of the load carrying material, you select one of these three curves and you draw a, a line parallel to the, the selected curve through that point that you've got. And then the line will intersect all the different materials that can uh, operate equally satisfactorily and give you the minimum mass in the design. Now the interesting thing about this is sometimes you'll end up with a design that has a whole lot of cross-sectional, a whole lot of material to develop the strength. Say you make it out of a foam or something. Uh, but it still has very low mass. And so this is just nice because once you figure out what point you need to draw it through and you draw a line parallel to the appropriate curve, then it intersects a bunch of materials and gives you a bunch of options. So here's what's called a, uh, what was it called? A, a stiff weightless panel. And the idea here is that the panel only deflects from the external load applied to it. Um, and in the process of deflecting, there's, there's no weight causing it to deflect. We're neglecting the weight, okay? So this is a, a rigid or, or very stiff uh, panel uh, that has a certain load on it. Now, that particular panel will follow the steepest curve. That's the one you would, would copy into another area of the diagram. If you've got a beam, it really doesn't matter what the beam cross-section is. That is taken out of this analysis. Obviously, there, there are better beam cross-sections than others, and we'll discover that later in the course. But the, the beams basically follow a different uh, curve. You can see it's the one in the center. And finally, a, um, I've forgotten the name of this. It's a, a rigid rod or a stiff rod. I don't remember what it's called. Um, it's something where you just have a, a rod, and it doesn't have to be a round cross-section. It can be other, others, but there's just an axial load here. These are three fairly simple, straightforward geometries that follow these three curves. And uh, actually those geometries are reused in the next diagram where you're looking at elastic modules, basically a stiffness versus weight or, or density. And so our uh, plate, our rigid plate is the, again, the steepest curve. Uh, the beams are the middle curve and the rod is the lowest sloped curve. And so you can kind of see how the materials lay out in density versus stiffness. And it's not really a surprise, right? I mean, mo metals are a very stiff material, uh, but they're also a very dense material, so they end up in the upper right corner uh, of the graph. Like I said, I highly recommend a materials selection text on this topic because there are many other diagrams like this that are very useful. And it's not like this gives you a... Um, you know, okay, here's the perfect material for you to use. Most of the time the geometry of your components are such that none of these curves are the ideal curve. Again, that's why I would refer you back to the textbooks that, that teach you how to analyze different geometries. But also, these are just sort of a first order approximation because the, the previous chart had strength on the y-axis. Okay, what strength are we talking about? Because for steels, you know, there's a different strength metric. Really, you usually talk about the yield strength there because once the material yields, it's changed shape, and that's often considered a failure. But there was concrete, right? And concrete is a brittle material. So how do you, what strength are we talking about there? Well, obviously, it's the ultimate strength of the concrete. And when you're talking about wood or, or um, uh, rubber, what kind of failure do you, or, you know, what's, what is the ultimate strength in that case? And each one of those are different. So again, this is not a perfect comparison between materials, but it's at least a starting point and a very useful starting point at that.